Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be in Genesis 3 and 4 and Moses 4 and 5. Which is really the story of Adam and Eve and their, the beginning of their family. But we're going to start by jumping back to premortal life and the conflict that kind of began between Lucifer and Jehovah and who's going to be the Messiah. Now, just a side note, one of my biggest pet peeves is sometimes in this church you hear people say that in the premortal life, God didn't know what to do, and so he asked for a plan. Now, that's a little blasphemous if you think about it, that God didn't have a plan and didn't know what to do and said, hey, what do you guys think we should do, and, and that he got two people proposing plans. That's false doctrine. The Father presented his plan in premortal life. Let's get the doctrine straight. The Father presented his plan, which calls for a Redeemer. So the question on the table is, whom shall I send? Who should be the Messiah? And that's where two people step forward to fill that role. So in Moses chapter 4, the first few verses, we get this great insight into the two teams you can play on. Now, Alma will say in Alma chapter 5 that if you're not the sheep of the good shepherd who's calling you, you're the sheep of the other shepherd. So which team do you really want to play on? Here's Satan. He steps forward and says, Behold, here am I, send me, I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind that one soul shall not be lost. Now, how's he going to do that? In verse 3, he's going to do that by destroying agency. You don't have the choice. You can't choose anything but to follow him. So not one soul will be lost. But here's the twist, ready? Surely I will do it, therefore give me thine honor. The real difference between the two captains is the desire, who gets the credit for what they do? Satan says, look, if I'm going to do the work, I get the credit. And I would suggest that we play on his team when we want the credit and the glory for what we do, even the good things, even the things of God. I want to do God's work, and I want to get the credit. I want the light to shine on me. That's Satan's team. You better notice me. Satan's team is all about their glory. Now contrast that with verse 2, but behold my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. I would suggest, I know this is a long ways away, and none of us are there, and that's okay. We're working on this. We don't need to beat ourselves up that we're not totally celestial. But I would suggest that if you follow Christ all the way to the end of the row, the one thing you're going to have to give up is your pride. You're going to have to give up the desire for the credit, the limelight. That, I think, is the major difference between Satan's team and Christ's team, is everything Jesus does, he does for the glory of the Father. Let me illustrate. Now, I know we did this last year in Doctrine and Covenants, but it's absolutely a beautiful illustration of the man that we worship in Jesus. If you'll go back to Doctrine and Covenants section 19, it is the only place we can find Jesus describing his agony in Gethsemane. Now, the point he's trying to make is that if you don't repent, you're going to suffer like I suffer. So let me describe that. Let me give you a taste of that. But it's the only time that we find Christ talking about himself. And notice he doesn't even finish the sentence. 
before he points the glory to the Father. Verse 18, where he says, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, and then he talks about his pain. But I love that verse 18 does not end with a period. It ends with a dash. He doesn't even finish the sentence. He pauses and points the glory to the Father. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father. That is the difference between the two teams. And I think we all need to decide which team we want to play on. In C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce, which is a beautiful story about the difference between heaven and hell. It's not a book on marriage. It's a book on the divorce of heaven and hell, that they are never going to be the same place. The idea is it's a group of ghosts from hell that go on vacation to heaven, and every one of them are allowed to stay if they let go of the one thing that they're holding on to that's keeping them in hell. Well, there's this painter in the book who is mesmerized by the landscape of heaven, and he wants to paint it. Now, each one of these ghosts has a little escort come down from heaven itself to kind of escort them into heaven and encourage them. So his escort says, look, it was from here that the messages came. When you painted on earth, it was to give people a glimpse of this landscape, but here you are. So he's really upset. You mean there's going to be no painting in heaven? He says, oh, no, you'll see things that no one else sees, and you'll want to tell us about them. So they start hobbling their way up to heaven proper, and he says, well, how soon could I begin painting? And his escort just kind of laughs and says, dude, you you don't get it. You're never going to paint if that's what you're interested in. He said, if you're interested in the country only for the sake of painting it, you'll never learn to see the country. But that's just how a real artist is interested in the country. Oh, no, 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 you're forgetting, said the Spirit. Now, as I read the rest of this, I want you to think of the temptation for the credit, for the glory of what we do here on earth. That is not how you began, said the Spirit. Light itself was your first love. You painted only as a means of telling about light. Oh, that was ages ago, said the ghost. One grows out of that. Of course, you haven't seen my later works. One becomes more and more interested in paint for its own sake. Now listen to this response. One does indeed. I also have had to recover from that. It was all a snare. Ink and paint were necessary down there, but they were also dangerous stimulants. Every poet and musician and artist, but for the grace of God, is drawn away from the love of the thing that it tells to the love of the telling. And it doesn't stop at being interested in pain either. They sink lower, become interested in their own personalities, and then in nothing but their own reputations. Do you see that concept? The difference between the two teams is, for whose glory do you do the work? So I would invite each one of us to examine, how do you live your life? Do you live your life for God's glory? Or do you constantly seek out your glory? Does it drive you crazy if people don't know whose idea it really was? I think that's one of the major messages this week. I love a little line from Joseph Fielding Smith's solemn assembly. This is the moment where he becomes the president of the church. And at that solemn assembly, where he stands to speak, he says the following, Men are only instruments in the Lord's hands. And the honor and the glory for all that his servants accomplish is and should be ascribed unto him forever. Now, that being said, let's follow Satan down to this earth when he gets cast out and he's sent to this earth because he wants the glory. Now we get to Adam and Eve and that story. Yeah. So Genesis 3 starts talking about this serpent. Genesis 3 verse 1 reads as follows. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden of Eden? 
So at the very beginning of Genesis 3, we have this Nachash, this serpent who's coming to Eve. Now, Christian readers are going to read this as this is Satan, this is the adversary. And we've talked about in earlier podcasts how the name Satan isn't going to come up till much later, but in the Moses narrative, through the Restoration, we understand that Satan is active and he's a, a vital part of this story as contained in Genesis 3. But the text of Genesis 3 just talks about this serpent. And at the beginning, we read that he's subtle. And not to be too punny, but there's a subtle pun happening with that word. You see, the word for subtle, the Hebrew word is arum. And the word for Adam and Eve's nakedness is arom. And it's just a very slight change in the voweling of those two words, You see, subtle can mean crafty or sly, but it can also mean uncovered. And so in Genesis 2, where we read that Adam and Eve were arom, they were naked. But where we read here in Genesis 3, 1, that Satan is subtle, we read that he's arom. And my take on this, because covering, or the word for covering is a symbol of the atonement, this is an individual that is outside of the covering. I like that as an image, to just right out of the gate, come and look at this, being as one who's from another world. And even that word nechash, it can mean serpent, but it can mean to hiss, but it can also be connected to a shining one or one that is bronze or, or brilliant, but it can also be connected to ideas of enchantment or magic. And so I think this word is trying to evoke in its ancient audience a way to think outside of this world. This is a being who's not like the other ones. So 2 Nephi 9 is Jacob giving us this perspective that the serpent or the devil fell from heaven, that he's an angel that fell from heaven. 2 Nephi 2 is Lehi speaking to Jacob, and in this text, Lehi is going to lay out his understanding of the fall of Adam and Eve from his perspective of reading the plates of brass. And so if you go to verse 18 of 2 Nephi 2, it says, that he had fallen from heaven, and then about the middle of verse 18, he says, Yea, even that old serpent, who was the devil, who is the father of all lies, wherefore he said, Partake of the forbidden fruit, and ye shall not die, but ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And after Adam and Eve have partaken the forbidden fruit, they were driven out of the Garden of Eden to till the earth. I don't think that Genesis 3 by itself, if that's all you have, is going to really explain what's going on. I think that reading the Bible through the lens of the Book of Mormon is going to help us to understand a little bit more about what's happening with this serpent. Now, obviously, Christian authors are going to do some similar things, but it's important to note that Nephi and Lehi and Jacob, they're connecting the serpent to an angel who fell from heaven. So that being said, let's look at what we read about in the Moses narrative. So if you go to the Moses chapter 4 narrative, it says that Satan sought to destroy the agency of man. That's Moses 4.3. And so in the slides, we have a graphic, and we call this How Agency Works. And this graphic is directly connected to 2 Nephi 2. And so if you go to 2 Nephi 2, you see that for agency to be operative, you have to have basically four things. You have to have, according to verse 10 and 11 of 2 Nephi 2, opposition. You have to have laws. That's 2 Nephi 2, 5 and 13. The third thing you have to have is knowledge. You can't really have agency if you don't know what you're choosing. And then finally, you have to have the ability to choose or the power to choose. In other words, the more choices and the more power you have, the more agency you have. I would even add a fifth. In verse 16, it says you have to be enticed by both. If good were the only thing that enticed us, we really wouldn't have a choice. You have to be enticed by both. So we're going to see in the fall that the Lord is going to set up a system which part of us is enticed by good and part of us is enticed by evil. And if that weren't the case, we wouldn't have agency. Yeah, excellent. And so to see how this works and how he wants to destroy the agency of man— I like to engage students to talk about, okay, how does taking one of these or two of these things away affect our agency? So for example, if we lose the ability to choose, what does that do to our agency? Or if we lose knowledge, or if laws get changed, or laws become irrelevant, 
this is a great way to expose how the adversary works and to help us to retain our agency. You see, I really do think that the adversary, that Satan tries to change words or the meanings of words to cloud our ability to see to take away our knowledge. And in the imagery of the Book of Mormon, it's the mist of darkness that blinds and hardens. That's what Satan's trying to do, is blind and harden. And sometimes it's a single word. In last week's podcast, we talked about the very word every, that God says, of every tree I can you can eat. And then Satan comes in and uses that very word to twist so that we blind and harden. Wait a minute, didn't God say you could eat from every tree? And there's a great example of him using a single word to kind of play on the, oh, we're being denied something, that God's holding out, and he's secretly keeping things from you, and I'm going to give you a way to know all that he knows. And it's just that subtle twist that he's always after, and sometimes it just comes down to a single word, Mike. Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of how he operates, and... Sometimes he'll shout out the opposition and shout it down so that there's only one way to choose. There's a phrase in 2 Nephi 2 where Lehi says, all things would become a compound in one if it weren't for opposition. And I really do think that's one of his objectives is to just drown out the opposition. If he can take away opposition, then he can limit agency. I think that addictions are another one. Addictions limit our power to choose. And so you can use this graphic to have a good discussion in a classroom to talk about real life situations whereby agency can be increased or decreased depending on how those five things are addressed. So speaking of Satan and how he twists things, it sure appears like Adam and Eve got conflicting commandments in the garden, and he's going to play on that and try and blind and harden our hearts to God. Why would God give two conflicting commandments? But there's some great explanations here. Back in Moses chapter 2, God gave the original commandment, which was in verse 28, Moses 2, 28, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But then in Moses chapter 3, and again in Moses 4, he says, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. And then that gets repeated by Lucifer. This is now chapter 4, verse 8 of Moses. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which thou beholdest in the middle of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it lest you should die. So why the apparent conflicting commandments? There's a lot of ways you can look at this. Mike, what would you say? First of all, I would say that this story is our story. And so I think if we stop trying to be so literal with everything in the text, it kind of frees us up to look at it in other ways. And so, for example, what if the Garden of Eden represents a space symbolically for when I was in God's presence? And I, through my own volition, had to choose to come down and partake of sin and death, to live in a world of chaos, but in a world where I could gain knowledge and gain a body and learn by experience to rely on the Savior. I think if I read the text this way as a personal story of my journey, it kind of helps me understand that it had to be my choice. You see, I'm I'm raising children right now as you are, Bryce, and how many times do we know what's best for our children? but we can't force it on them. It has to be their choice. In the temple, we kind of have this, where there's this invitation, are you ready to make these covenants? If you're not ready, you don't have to. I kind of see that in this story of the Garden of Eden, where God says, here you are, but you have a choice. And, and there's that verse in Moses where he says, nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself. Let's read that real yeah. quick. Back in Moses chapter 3, Right after he says, verse 17, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee, but remember that I forbid it, for in the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. I mean, what commandment reads like that, that you've read, where the Lord says, thou shalt not kill, nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself. And so I think this commandment to not eat the fruit of the tree And especially with this verse in Moses, I think it's inviting us to rethink it. And so I just want to read this from President Joseph Fielding Smith, and I want to read this through the lens of this story is my story. I'm in God's presence, and do I really want to come to mortality? And 
I want to read it also through the lens of a loving father who's not going to force me, but he's going to show me and then I'm going to make the decision. So here it is. Here's what President Smith says. Now, this is the way I interpret that. The Lord said to Adam, and I would add Eve, here is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you want to stay here, then you cannot eat of that fruit. If you want to stay here, then I forbid you to eat it. But you may act for yourself, and you may eat it if you want to. And if you eat it, you will die. Another commentator put it this way. What therefore did God really say to them in the garden? I suggest that he might have said something like this. If you want to stay in the Garden of Eden with no cares and no possibility of growth, you should not eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. However, if you desire to grow and receive all that I have in store for you, you will have to leave the garden. If you eat of the tree, you will be cast out of the garden and into the earth and into mortality, and you will die both temporally and spiritually. But you will open the door for yourselves and for all of humanity to receive eternal life like I have. The choice is yours. In other words, God gave them information. And so I like that. I really think that if we read this symbolically, we see this as a loving Heavenly Father who says, you're in my presence, but if you want to continue in growth, you must pass through this experience. Now, gematria, or this idea of the, the Hebrew letters having numerical equivalents, is a thing in Judaism. And if you take the characters for the words, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you take the numerical equivalent for the characters for the words, the tree of life, you get a one to four principle. If you add those up and you look at them and the tree of life is the one and the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the four. And so from a typological perspective, if you want to get to the one, the echad, the one coming back into God's presence, you can't get to it without going through the four. And the symbol of four is mortality. What that is trying to illustrate or to teach is that there is no other way. The only way to the echad or the one is through the four. And so in some parts of Judaism, they looked at this as a tree within a tree that the tree of life was wrapped up in the tree of knowledge. And so the only way to it was through mortality. By the way, this is all coming out of Friedrich Beinerup's book called Roots of the Bible. But my point is, from a Latter-day Saint perspective, that makes absolute sense. If I want to get back into the Savior's presence, I must walk through this veil of sorrow and death. That's the price. That's what it takes. And so I like it. If you nerd out in the numbers, I think it's really cool. And it's also the root of Adam's name. Adam's name is, it's Aleph, Daleth, Mem, but it starts with the one, the Aleph, and then the Daleth is the fourth character. And the Mem is the 40. And the 40 is, we're going to see throughout the Old Testament, trials. So Adam is the embodiment of coming from the Echad, from the one, to mortality, to experience trials. And remember, typologically, us, men and women collectively, we are all ha-adam. We are all the Adam. All of us are. Even in Moses, it says, I shall call him Adam, which is many. That's us. And so we are Adam. So I like to read it that way. I think it's really beautiful. So let me do my take on the conflicting commandments, because we do have to fall, and the fall is essential, and the fall needs to be our choice. But I think there's an interesting way to understand the conflicting commandments. I believe it was a temporary commandment to not partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that eventually that commandment would be lifted, that they would be authorized to partake of it and move forward, but that it had to be their choice. Now, I'm going to speak in code here. Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about, but you'll understand why I need to speak in code. I want you to imagine that in our house, there's a car for our teenagers to drive, and you cannot drive that car unless you get the keys from mom and dad. So you need to go somewhere, you get the keys from mom and dad, you go drive and you're fine. And then one day, mom and dad aren't there. And let's hypothetically speak, Eaton, I have this conniving little trickster of an 18-year-old son. And one day, my 15-year-old son says, boy, I really need to do this. And he says, well, why don't you take the car? Well, I'm only 15. Oh, it's okay. You're close enough to being 16. And my 18-year-old gives the keys to my 15-year-old and says, go drive the car. <laughs> 
And so my 15-year-old goes out, drives the car, and gets in an accident. Now, mom and dad come home, and we're going to punish the 18-year-old, right? And the 18-year-old's going to say, wait a minute, I'm just doing the same thing that you do. I was in charge. I was the parent in the house because you guys were gone, and I gave him permission to use the car. So he didn't do anything wrong. And then we punish the 18-year-old, and he gets mad that he got punished for doing something that mom and dad do all the time, but mom and dad don't get punished for doing it. Do you see what I'm trying to teach? He got mad for being punished for doing something that someone else did and didn't get punished, which suggests to me that the commandment to not partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a temporary commandment. Like it had to do with being authorized. Timing. Yeah. And that fits the pattern today, because every one of us have been commanded to multiply and reproduce the earth, and yet until you're married, it's forbidden. In other words, we have the same conflicting commandments. I have a seven-year-old son who's been commanded to multiply and replenish the earth, but he's not doing a very good job at it. Well, no one has a problem with that, because we know it's a timing thing. And I would suggest that it was a timing issue in the garden, and that Satan took advantage of that timing thing to get them to partake so that he could rush them over and have them partake of the tree of life, but that eventually the timing would be over, and now the command would change, and then they would be authorized to partake of the fruit. And they would do so with God's blessing, but it would have to be their choice to do so because they would be kicked out of his presence. I believe there is some great logical explanations as to why he gave them at that time a conflicting commandment, but that, yes, eventually they could have obeyed all of Heavenly Father's commandments and not had to face a conflict in their obedience. We put some other good quotes in the show notes. One of my favorites is from Alonzo Gaskill, and another one is from Elder Oaks. And Elder Oaks says this, he says, the transition couldn't have happened without a transgression, and he, he calls it an exercise of moral agency amounting to a willful breaking of a law. And he said, this would be a planned offense, a formality to serve an eternal purpose. And then he credits Eve. So you can read Elder Oaks's comments there. And, and I, like I said, I really like uh, Gaskell's comments on this. And he wrote a great book called The Savior and the Serpent, Unlocking the Doctrine of the Fall, which I would highly recommend as well. I think there's so much nuance to this text. We're kind of touching the main points, but I think that reading this text, at least for me, as my story, leaving God's presence and how I can come back into God's presence is one way to read it that really helps me without having to get into so much literalism. Like, you know, I can't even tell you how many times I've had conversations with people that don't believe in the Bible or they don't believe in, in God, and they'll say, so you, Mike Day, really believe in talking snakes. I don't necessarily believe that there was a snake talking in the garden, and so I don't take all of these things literally, but I take them as symbols or types to teach higher truths. We all know that sin and death exists, and we all know that there's opposition, and frankly, The command to multiply and replenish the earth is such a strong command that God put it into our DNA. I mean, this is happening. So we can talk about these things, and we can also look at them as an etiological tale. And what that means is a way to describe how things are. There are so many things in Genesis that are etiological in nature, meaning that they're trying to explain why the world is how it is. For example, why do we have to till the earth? Why do we wear clothes? Why do we get married? Why do we have opposition? How is there death? This is the beginning of trying to figure out how the world works. So with that in mind, let's get to the actual temptation of Eve to partake of the fruit. Notice in verse 12, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it became pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make her wise, she took of the fruit and did eat and also gave unto her husband with her. But the fall was a blessing. We have to get that into our heads. That's 2 Nephi chapter 2. Lehi says to Jacob, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen. But he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, 
And all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. And they would have had no children. The fall is what allows us to have children and families. How is that a bad thing? That is the greatest blessing in my life, to have a wife, to have children, to have celebrated this recent Christmas season and have all of our children come home and our grandchildren and those precious moments, that was the gift of the fall. Had there been no fall, they would have had no children. And not only that, Lehi says in verse 23, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. The fall was a tremendous blessing in our lives, and now living in this fallen world, as much as we hate it, I spent a great deal of time yesterday fixing my daughter's furnace. It broke down in the middle of a cold, wintry day. And that's mortality, right? Cars break down, and we have car accidents, and houses break, and our bodies break, And sometimes we curse this mortal existence, and we long to live in Eden. But they would not have been happy in Eden. They were innocent. They knew no misery. They couldn't do good because they couldn't do bad. Did Adam ever wake up one day in Eden and say, wow, wow, what a beautiful day today is? As opposed to what? What other day could he compare today to? He couldn't be happy without opposition. And so I love, and this is both in the Genesis count and in the Moses count. So this is not unique to just Latter day Revelation. This is in the Bible. In Genesis 3, verse 17, and then again in Moses 4, 23, this earth is cursed for our sake as a blessing. Having sorrow in conception is a blessing. Having thorns and thistles is a blessing. Working by the sweat of our face is a blessing. All of those things create the agency necessary in order to make the choices. Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. This mortal life is exactly what Heavenly Father intended us to have because we could not get back to his presence without it. So this cursing that comes upon them and all of us It sure sounds like this negative thing, and Satan's going to twist it into this negative, horrible thing, but it's a cursing for our benefit, for our blessing. It brings families. It brings opposition. It does bring broken furnaces, but it also brings beautiful Christmas mornings where grandchildren run up to you and hug you and tell you how much they love you, and that's mortality the up and the down, the good and the bad, the joy and the pain. And we are here that we might have joy. Yeah. Genesis 3 is awesome. But if you take away the Book of Mormon, and I don't blame them, but our dear Christians that are outside of our faith tradition, if you just read Genesis 3 on on its own, Eve gets a bad rap. And the early Christian fathers say some really mean things about Eve. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read them in this podcast, but as I read Christian history, my heart has sunk for Eve and for women in general, because they really have had a bad rap. And yet the first person to give a discourse on the nature of the fall and how life comes to pass is Chava. It's Eve. She's the one that gives the discourse because she understands. And it's the restoration of the gospel that brings us to our understanding. And I think it's beautiful and I think it's awesome. And so if you're outside of our faith tradition and you're reading the Bible and you're like, this doesn't make any sense, I would invite you to read Second Nephi 2, do a careful reading, and then go back and read Genesis 3. Now, that opposition also introduces that we can do good and we can also do evil. Even the words, I just want to nerd out just for a second on the words. Like if you look in Genesis 3, cursed is the ground for thy sake. That's verse 17. And sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. And then notice verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it, what? The land, the Eretz, is going to bring forth. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. 
and the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return. Now in 19, where we're going to return to the ground. But Jesus is going to say, we're going to return back to God. So if you go to the Sermon on the Mount, just look at this briefly. If you look in verse 13 of chapter 7 of Matthew, Jesus says, enter ye in at the straight gate. And then he says in verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Chava, that's Eve's name, the, the life bearer. And few there be that find it. And then skip down to verse 16. So we're coming back into God's presence. So we're leaving behind the world. Look what it says. We're going to talk about how can I know good from the bad? This is going to be the story of Cain and Abel. So verse 15 is kind of referring to that story, which we're going to read in a minute. Verse 16 says, ye shall know them by their fruits. So the fall introduced the idea that we can do works, our fruits. And then he says, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Acantha and tribalone, thorns and thistles. It's the same word that's used in the Genesis narrative. The earth we live in is a place where the acantha and tribalone are reigning, the thorns and thistles of this life. So what are we doing ritually in Matthew 7? We're leaving that space, and we're coming to the tree. This is going to be a motif throughout the Old Testament that there's this tree in the Holy of Holies on top of a rock. And so if you look in verse 19, every tree that bringeth forth good fruit comes in. I'm kind of playing with the text in verse 19. But verse 20 says, by their fruits ye shall know them. Verse 21 of Matthew 7 says that they are to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but not everyone. Those that have the fruits, those that are, verse 24, wise that have built their house upon the rock. For God's truth, verse 25, it was, quote, founded upon a rock. And so the ideas of Matthew 7 and the Sermon on the Mount are directly connected, even in the words, to this story in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, we're leaving God's presence, and then in Matthew 7, we are entering God's presence. And so to me, I just geek out on this. You've got to read Matthew 7, and you've got to read Genesis 3, because Jesus knows this story back and forth, and he understands the ritual connected with it, because this text was read in a drama setting with ritual. And if you've been to the temple, you guys know what I'm talking about. So reading Genesis 3 and 4 through the lens of the temple will help Latter-day Saints to see the layers of the meaning in this text. And I really do think that the story of creation was connected directly to ritual and a temple setting. If you recall some of the things we talked about previously at the new year, the creation of the world was in drama form presented. And this is not just happening in Israel. This is happening in Egypt. This is happening in Babylon. This is happening in the cultures of the ancient Near East. And it's because the creation of the world represented how we could find our origins and connecting ourselves back to God, that Adam and Eve were the first king and queen. They were the the lords over the whole earth that were to have dominion. And we come from Adam and Eve. And so by extension, we are Adam and Eve. We are to be lords over the whole earth, over our dominion, as it were. And so if we see the layers of this, we can look at this narrative in a different way. And so for one thing, the garment of skin that we've talked about before in Genesis 3.21, this is a garment, the word is or, and it can be skin or it can be light. The words are synonymous They're spelled almost identically. And so this garment of light that Adam and Eve received or garment of skin, I see this as a duality. In other words, a garment of light, the glory that they had from God, the garment of skin to cover their mortal flesh. In other words, you have one that's a spiritual garment and one that's a physical garment. And I would just say, go and read the Hymn of the Pearl. We'll link this in the show notes. The Hymn of the Pearl was an early Christian text that talked about this, this idea that we are pilgrims here on earth. We are just strangers to be here for a short time, but we are looking for reminders of our Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. If you read Hymn of the Pearl, that's what's going on. And to me, this garment of light or a garment of skin is a connection back to God. Another ritual action that's connected to the temple is this idea of eating and being dressed by God. And so there's eating in this text. Now, in Christianity and in Judaism, as we go through Exodus, it's going to be eating bread. And so eating bread and being dressed by God are both 
temple ritual actions. And they're also connected to the Sermon on the Mount. There is eating and there is being dressed by God in Matthew 5 through 7. And so when we connect this, we're going to talk about the cursings in a minute, but this idea of Adam eating the bread but he's going to eat it by the sweat of his brow. This is the connection. I think that the curse isn't the bread, but the curse is the sorrow. And that childbirth is not a curse, but a sacred act. Now, we've mentioned in other podcasts this idea of Aved and Shamar. This is where Adam and Eve are to dress and to keep the garden. This is going to be so important as we get into the narrative that discusses Cain in the next chapter. But in this text, that is a word that means to serve, or it means it's translated as to dress. So Adam and Eve are to dress, and then shamar can mean keep, but it can also mean to stand watch. And these are temple words that are associated with the priests in the temple. And you can read this, for example, in Numbers 3, 7, and 8, Numbers 8, 25, and 26. You can read it in First Chronicles 23:32 and Ezekiel 44. This idea that the priests were to aved and shamar, they were to serve and to keep or to guard the temple. Well, in this context, the garden is a prototypical temple. And so Adam and Eve are the first priest and priestess of the temple. And so what does this say about us? One of the things I think it tells us is that I am to serve, I am to do the things that a follower of Christ should do, but I am also to shamar. I am also to keep not only the commandments, but to keep watch, to stand at the ready, hearing the voice of God, and let it sink deep into my heart. And the tree of life is probably connected to the lampstand that was in the tabernacle and later the temple that was just outside the Holy of Holies in Israel's temple. And it looked like a small tree trunk. And now when we get into Exodus, we'll read how it's literally a stylized tree. And so this tree of life is connected to the temple. Now the ark is also connected to the garden of Eden. And you might wonder, well, how does the ark of the covenant, what does that have to do with the temple? Part of it is, is because touching the ark and the tree of knowledge resulted in death. But I would add that touching the things the ark could bring, specifically the good things, would also bring life. You see, the tree of knowledge of good and evil introduced duality. It introduced a juxtaposition of opposites. It introduced life, but it also introduced death. Well, the ark of the covenant contained wisdom. It contained life but touching it could bring death. And I think that these symbols are not accidental. I think that this is purposely put into the text. And I think that the authors of Genesis and Exodus are inviting us to think deeply about the scriptures. The last thing I would just add is there's this river that's coming out of Eden. And we talked about it before, how it parts into four heads. And so if you read some of these post-exilic stuff associated with the temple, or if you read Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12, or Revelation 21, 1 and 2, what we have is a river flowing out from under the Aben Shatia, the, the foundation stone in the Holy of Holies. It's flowing out from under this, out of the Holy of Holies, and into the earth, And everything, at least in the Ezekiel narrative, everything that the water touches is made whole, is healed. And this river flowing out of Eden is going to part into four heads. And it doesn't say this in the text, Bryce, but this is how I'm reading it. As it parts into four heads, we then read that the pieces of land that it touches have a diversity of resources. And not all land is the same. And so the river that flows out of Eden introduces this what some scholars call multiplicity, or I'm just going to call it mortality, like the things that are associated with being mortal. It's a duality once again. So in the Genesis narrative, it flows out of Eden and enters into this multiplicity or a mortal sphere. But in the Ezekiel narrative, it does the reverse. The water flows out from under the temple and everything it touches is made whole. And so the water functions both ways. And it's kind of like the narrative in 1 Nephi 8 and 11. You have that river of filthy water, but there's also this idea that the water is also pure. It's just such an interesting image. So water isn't only one thing. 
the water parting into the four heads is also going to be connected to the temple. So once again, this garden is a prototypical temple, and Adam and Eve are to become as, quote, one of us, becoming as the gods. You see, in Genesis, they are gods, plural, and they say Adam and Eve have become as we have become. So what does that mean? Well, the first question is this, what did Adam and Eve know before the fall? It seems as though there was not a veil to separate them from the presence of the Lord at that time, that Adam and Eve walked and conversed with God. Now, we put a lot of quotes in the show notes about this. Some of this stuff's coming to us from Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt was an associate of Joseph Smith. And so I think this is coming from Joseph Smith. But like I said, I don't have Joseph Smith's words. But essentially what Orson Pratt is saying is that Adam and Eve walked and conversed with God. And so in that context, they were as the gods. They knew them. They talked to them. And there was no veil between them. An overarching way to look at this is that they're in God's presence, but they need to partake of mortality. And when they do, they will then again be brought back into God's presence. And it's the Book of Mormon that really teaches this well, that to become wise means to be coming back into God's presence. So in Genesis 3, 6, we read that they eat the fruit. Note that after Adam eats, they discover that they're naked. Now, the text isn't saying this. This is just my interpretation. Bryce, what do you think about this? The way I'm reading this is it was when they both ate. It was kind of like they both collectively ate, and now we're ready to go into mortality. Now they know they're naked. What do you take with that? Well, I think there's a lot of things happening here. It's the way Satan presents that. Notice, you know, Eve says, well, I can't eat that fruit because Heavenly Father says I shouldn't touch it, and I'm going to die. And Satan says, no, you won't die. You'll become as one of the gods. Notice the twist on that. If you eat that fruit, you'll become as one of the gods. He's trying to hint that God is holding back, that God is hiding something that would be of his benefit. Now, is there a little truth to that, that mortality would be to their benefit? But the twist on that is that it's Oh, you better partake of this because there's something God's not telling you. Do you see how he just corrupts everything? So nakedness is the same thing. In the gospel perspective, it's, yeah, we are exposed and we need to be covered. And that's a good thing because it's going to lead to the coats of skins that cover us. That being here in mortality and transgressing, it is a good thing, and God has provided a covering that will cover that nakedness. But Satan's going to take that nakedness and associate it with shame. And he's going to create this toxic perfectionism that we talked about in our last podcast, that you're naked, you're not worthy, you need to go hide. And he's going to emphasize on the, you better hide from God's presence. God doesn't love you anymore. And he's rejected you and, and you're out of his favor. And, and that's happening in the world today. And so that nakedness again has that duality that yes, here I am in mortality to learn from my mistakes. And there's an atonement. I can use to fix that versus the shame I got to run away and hide from God. So this is where they first try to cover themselves with aprons and fig leaves, which don't work. And then they finally confess their transgression and the father covers them with coats of skin. So we covered a lot of that in our past podcast. We're really not going to touch on much of that. But a lot of what happens after they partake pertains to us here and now. Yeah. So there's three cursings. The serpent's going to get some cursings, Eve's going to get some, and then finally Adam's going to get some. So the serpent, look at his curse. So this is, we're back to Genesis 3, verse 14. And Moses 4.20, if you're in Moses. Yeah, so either way. Um, The Lord said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Dust is this symbol for death and mortality. I will put enmity or hostility or hatred between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now there's a lot going on with that verse, but if you look in the footnotes, I think the footnotes can help us out. The idea is that there's going to be hatred or hostility or enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the seed of the serpent and the woman's seed. And it 
shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This enmity is going to crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent is going to bruise his heel. Now, what does that mean? And I really love the footnote if you look in 15C, where it talks about crushing or grinding the head of the serpent. But if you go down a little bit more, it says, Jesus Christ foreordained prophecies about Jesus. You see many Christian readers read verse 15 as the serpent's ability to bruise the heel of the Savior, but his atonement, because he's the seed of the woman, his atonement crushed death and hell. And that's beautiful imagery. The idea that Jesus came to earth and he conquered death and hell, but in so doing, the serpent bruised his heel. Now, think about the cross. You see, on the cross, perhaps one of the nails even pierced the heel of the Savior as he was being crucified, but in so doing, he crushed death and hell. So I think embedded in the curse of this serpent is an allusion to the atonement of Jesus Christ, which I think is really beautiful, and it's written in code embedded right here in this text. And so that's the curse on the serpent, but there's two more curses. Yeah, the curse to Eve has been so misread and misinterpreted He says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And I think, again, you can see that as the negative or the positive. The negative is focusing on the sorrow that this is a punishment. I'm going to make pregnancy and I'm going to make childbirth so painful for you as a punishment. But I think the other side, you can see that as because we are now in this mortal life, you can now conceive and bring forth children that that door is now open, that children are now a possibility. And that's going to happen through, yes, a painful experience, but there's that duality. The painful experience of pregnancy and childbirth brings the rewarding experience of children in our into our family. So see that as the positive that it is. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. I will multiply thy conception. And you can now bring forth children. But I want to focus on that last word, rule over thee. Your desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Boy, if if any word in the Scriptures has caused more pain, I can't think of one. This idea of men ruling over women has been the source of so much pain in this world, and we need to be the ones that say, no, that's not what God intended. I take you back to the symbolism of the rib. We do not believe that Eve was literally taken from Adam's rib, that that's symbolism to teach us a lesson, that the Father made it very clear in the Garden of Eden that men don't go above, ahead, below, or behind their wife. They stand side by side, always and forever. Um, Many years ago in 1991, when President Hinckley was the first counselor to Ezra Taft Benson, and President Benson was very sick, they received a sweet little letter from a 14-year-old girl bothered by the position of women in the church. They call her Virginia, but that was not her name. In that letter, she wrote, If we are all Heavenly Father's children, then why do the Scriptures say that men are to rule over women? And why in the Scriptures was Eve created from Adam? I may be foolish, but I honestly do not understand. President Hinckley then responded for President Benson by saying, I like to regard Eve as his masterpiece after all that had gone before, his final work before he rested from his labors. I do not regard her as being in second place to Adam. She was placed at his side. They were together in the garden. They were expelled together. They labored together in the world into which they were driven. Now, Virginia, I call attention to the statement in the Scriptures that Adam should rule over Eve. You ask why this is so. I do not know. I regrettably recognize that some men have used this through centuries of time as justification for abusing and demeaning women. But I am confident 
that in so doing they have demeaned themselves and offended the Father of us all, who I am confident loves his daughters just as much as he loves his son. I sat with President David O. McKay on one occasion when he talked about that very statement in Genesis. His eyes flashed with anger as he spoke of despotic husbands and stated they would have to make an accounting of their evil actions when they stand to be judged by the Lord. He indicated that the very essence of the spirit of the gospel demands that any governance in the home must be done only in righteousness. Now back to President Hinckley. My own interpretation of that sentence is that the husband shall have a governing responsibility to provide for, to protect, to strengthen, and shield the wife. Any man who belittles or abuses or terrorizes or who rules in unrighteousness will deserve and, I believe, receive the reprimand of a just God who is the eternal father of both his sons and daughters. I think that's very powerful. Now, President Kimball says something very similar, right, Mike? Yeah. President Kimball softens it to preside, which I like, but... I also understand that doesn't work for everyone. I was teaching a class one time, and I had some gals in there who were, shall we say, strong-minded, which, by the way, I really appreciate. My wife is a strong-minded woman, and they remind me of her. They just had strong wills and opinions, and I'm like, yes. And I had a sister say, you know, Brother Day, I hate this. I hate that that's in there. And I said, well, President Kimball softens it to preside, and she said, I still hate it. And I said, okay, good. Tell me why. Tell me why you hate it. And she said, well, to me, we're equal partners. And I said, you know, that's really good. Let's go to the proclamation. And we kind of read that. So I think although President Kimball says preside, which I like, I also understand that doesn't work for everyone. But that's kind of how it's used in the Old Testament. I'm going to geek out. The Hebrew word they're going to use for rule, mishal, literally means to rule or govern or preside. Now, it's yimshal, the way it's conjugated in the Hebrew, because it's he will rule. Yimshal, or mashal as it's used, is about 81 times in the Old Testament. So, for example, if you go to Genesis 24, it reads, Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over, or ha-mishal, over all the land, or if you look in Genesis forty five twenty six, talking about Joseph, it says, Joseph, Joseph of Egypt, is yet alive and is governor over all the land of Egypt, Mishal. He is the governor over all the land. And so the text of Genesis reads this way. And a biblical scholar by the name of John Walton is going to interpret this word to mean that the woman desiring to give life requires the cooperation of the man in order to procreate. You see, she's not going to be able to give life, which is what her name means, without the cooperation of the man. And so then he says further, the basic idea here is that the woman's desire, which renders her dependent, is traceable to her need to fulfill her maternal instinct. Just as chapter 2 established the basis for the man's need for the woman, Chapter 3 establishes the basis for the woman's need of the man. There's something about it being reciprocal. You see, the very key to my happiness is held by my wife, and the very key to her happiness is held by me. In other words, my wife rules over me in a sense because she holds the key to my happiness, but I hold the key to her happiness, and together, it's beautiful. There's something about working together. Yeah, that heals both of them. Yeah. From an ancient Near Eastern perspective, we have to have order, and Adam and Eve are going to represent the kingdom, and somebody has to be in charge. And to a Bronze Age thinker with kings and queens, that was the king. So if you look at this as Adam is the prototypical king and Eve is the queen, from a political concept, it makes sense. And remember, this was portrayed at the new year, and we're trying to establish authority, and we're doing all these rituals to remind everybody who's in charge. We do the same kind of thing in church. A couple times a year, we stand up in a ward, and a couple times in state conference, and a couple times in general conference, and we basically stand up and say, so-and-so is in charge. So we're still doing this just a little bit differently. Now, I'm totally okay with Joseph Smith using the same words. And he does. If you read the Moses narrative, he's doing the same thing. 
Um, Some of the reasons we bump into this is because in the church we practice hierarchical priesthood, where there's a hierarchy and one is above another. My bishop ceases to preside the moment my stake president walks into the meeting. He has hierarchical priesthood. But in the home, we practice patriarchal priesthood, and sometimes we get those confused, and we assume that in the home we practice hierarchical priesthood. We do not. Read the proclamation. They stand as equal partners in the home. No one is more in charge. Let's suppose a family consists of a 12-year-old deacon, a mom and a dad, and then the dad suddenly passes away. Does the 12-year-old deacon preside in that home? No. Because he holds the priesthood and mom doesn't? Absolutely not. Mom presides in that home because in the home we don't practice hierarchical priesthood. And husband and wife preside side by side. I don't necessarily call on people to say a blessing. My wife calls on people to say the blessing. I'm not in charge in the home. My wife and I together are in charge of the home. But during the pandemic, when we held the sacrament in our, in our home, that's where I, as the liaison to the church, stepped forward and oversaw the sacrament. There's an example of the merging between hierarchical priesthood and patriarchal priesthood. I'm the one that's going to oversee the sacrament in the home because I'm the representative of the church to the family. However, within the home, I don't preside in any way above my wife, nor does she preside above me. I don't go in front. I don't go behind. We walk side by side in all that we do in the home. Because we practice hierarchical priesthood in the church, do not make the assumption that that flows into the home and that we practice hierarchical priesthood in the home. We do not. This idea of men ruling over women has been the source of so much pain in this world, and we need to be the ones that say no. That's not what God intended. Yeah. And then finally, Adam eating the bread— Cursed is the ground for thy sake. That's verse 17. But he's going to eat it by the sweat of his brow. So once again, the curse isn't the bread, but the curse is the sorrow. But it's a cursing for our benefit. It brings families. It brings opposition. And that's mortality, the joy and the pain. Yeah, excellent. I think we're ready to get into chapter 4. Okay. So big picture chapter 4 is Genesis and Moses are not the same. So Moses talks about Adam and Eve having lots of children before Cain and Abel. But if you read the Genesis account, Adam and Eve have Cain, and then they have Abel, and then the famous story about Cain killing Abel, and am I my brother's keeper? So a couple of additions. This is why we need the JST, the Moses version, because there's a couple wonderful things that you're going to find in Moses. First of all, this idea of Adam offering sacrifice out of obedience and then being told why. This is a beautiful moment, and we introduce the two first laws of heaven. Now, this is on the church website. It's not something that we just teach only in the temple. In the temple, we are under covenant to obey the first two laws of heaven, which are obedience and sacrifice. You will find them all throughout the scriptures. We are here to learn to obey what Heavenly Father asks us. Do you remember back last week in Abraham chapter 3, where the Lord says, we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. We are here to learn to obey God. He is offering us unlimited power and glory. And you can't have omnipotent power unless you will do with it what God does with it. Therefore, as the test, we are here to be given instructions to see if we will obey those instructions as they've been given. If you think you're smarter than God, and say to him, I'm not going to do it your way, I'm going to do it my way, Heavenly Father has a reward for you, but you will not be able to receive his glory and his power, because it would destroy you, and you would destroy others with it. And so, the first law of heaven is, will you learn to do what God asks? 
And so he was given a commandment that they should worship the Lord their God and offer the firstlings of their flock. And Adam did that. Adam was obedient unto the commandment of the Lord. And there will come in all of our lives a moment where you are asked to obey and you may not know why. We are here to learn to trust God and do what he asks us to do. We don't do it blindly. He will guide us and help us and confirm to us that that is what he wants us to do. But when God gives a commandment, we are under covenant to obey it and to trust him. Adam did that. Now, after many days, an angel comes and says, let me introduce the second law of heaven and tell you why you've been asked to do this. And he speaks of Christ. He says in verse 7, this thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. In other words, Jesus is going to give up his life to save you. And that introduces the idea of you giving up this world to follow Christ into his kingdom. If you want to go where Christ is trying to take you, you can't take anything celestial or terrestrial. Bryce, I would also add that Joseph Smith is giving us invitation to read the Bible differently. You see, Joseph Smith's Bible was all about Jesus from the start. But you don't read this stuff in Genesis. We don't read all these things are a similitude of the Savior. Now, later Christians will reinterpret these texts, and they'll say, hello, Jesus is everywhere, but it's not in there. Yeah, That's kind of Joseph Smith's approach is like, hey— This is all about Jesus. And so I like what Joseph's doing, but it needs to be clear that this is not reading in Genesis. This is Moses material. Yeah, and it's essential for our salvation. As Christ gave up his life, we have to spend our lives giving up the world in which we live. And so we are introduced to the law of sacrifice. And the gist of the law of sacrifice is if you hold on to anything celestial— or anything terrestrial, it may very well keep you out of the celestial kingdom. You have to let go. Jesus will speak to his disciples in the New Testament and talk about carrying your own cross, crucifying the natural man, and therein is the law of sacrifice, so that we can follow Christ into a higher kingdom. So I love that little introduction that is not in the Genesis account about Adam obeying the law of obedience and sacrifice. But the rest of this chapter is focused on Cain. And C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters in which a chief devil trains an apprentice devil how to destroy a Christian. It's kind of reverse psychology. So I'm going to take that approach here and I'm going to point out how Satan manipulates Cain and leads him into being a son of perdition. So how do you create a son of perdition? That's a horrible list to make, and you know I like lists, but I think there's value in making this list. How do you lead someone into becoming a son of perdition? And Genesis isn't going to do this. This No. Moses is going to lay all this stuff out. Yeah. And step number one, the first step in becoming a, a son of perdition is you take the halo off of God. You fall out of love with God. In the words of the Book of Mormon, do you remember when King Benjamin, and we've used this a lot in in our podcast because I think it's a central part of the Book of Mormon. King Benjamin ends his discourse by saying, if you remember this one thing, everything else in your life is going to be fine. This one thing will carry you throughout the rest of life. And it's, you need to remember the greatness of God and the nothingness of man, that God is great and that man is nothing. But the way you become a son of perdition is you turn that, and you take the greatness away from God. And this happens today. I think we can look around and see people who are losing the awe and reverence for God that he deserves. There's a similar list in the book of Romans in the New Testament If you want to follow that one at the same time, Romans chapter 1 is about how to become a son of perdition. It's the two paths. There's a spiritual path, and then there's a carnal path. Now, Paul is writing to the Romans, and you know what Rome was like in those days. 
So how do you become, how do you live in a carnal society without becoming carnal? So Paul's going to walk them down the path of becoming carnal. This was taken out and then restored by Joseph Smith in the footnote to verse 18, footnote B, it says, who love not the truth. So I would say, Jess, that's number one. You love not the truth. When you fall out of love with God and the halo comes off God and he's no longer this majestic, wonderful being, when you say like Cain does, who is the Lord that I should know him? Paul's number two is in verse 16. I know that's going back in order, but I'm just going to put this one second. In verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which would suggest that those who fall out of love with God are ashamed of the gospel. And then going to the pearl of great price, as soon as you say, who is the Lord that I should know him? The next step is going to be that I don't know him and I don't care about him and I don't love him. So verse 18 is step number two in becoming a son of perdition. Cain loved Satan more than God. You fall out of love with God and in love with Lucifer. Now, in Paul's account in Romans, it takes a little different twist you love not the truth, you become ashamed of the truth. And now in verse 23, this is Romans 1, 23, you change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. And then in verse 25, you worship and serve the creature more than the creator. I love the carnal man inside me. I love pride and I love power. Now, knowing that I'm turning away from God, watch what Satan does. He sets up Cain to fail. So in verse 21, he has Cain offer a sacrifice and he knows the sacrifice is going to be rejected. So in verse 21, but unto Cain and to his offering, God had not respect. Now, Satan knew this and it pleased him. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. In other words, Satan is going to set you up to be offended. You're going to be offended by God or his church or his scriptures. Satan set Cain up to be offended when God didn't respect his ill-given offering. And when Cain is offended, verse 26, step number four in the process, Cain was wroth and listened not anymore to the voice of the Lord. And as soon as you're angry at God, you're going to turn against him. Now in verse 29 of Moses 5, when you're angry at God, Satan says unto Cain, swear unto me by thy throat, and if thou tell it, thou shalt die. Now we are in cahoots with Satan. I have walked off of God's team, and now I am making covenants with Satan. Instead of covenants with God, I am making covenants with Satan. And if you do that, verse 30 and 31, he teaches you his secret, which brings great power into your life, and now you have become his servant. And what the Book of Mormon teaches you, though, is that he doesn't care about you, and he'll trample you with his next servant, just like he did. Do you remember who trampled Korahor? The Zoramites trampled Korahor. Satan's new servant trampled his old servant as soon as his old servant was no longer useful to him. So there's kind of the process that we're going to find in Moses chapter 5 about how to become a son of perdition. So in Moses 5.33, after he's killed his brother and he takes his flock, we read this. Cain gloried in that which he had done, saying, I am free. Surely the flocks of my brother falleth into my hands. And Cain said, in verse 31, Truly I am Mahan, the master of this great secret, that I may murder and get gain. Wherefore Cain was called Master Mahan, and he gloried in his wickedness. Now that phrase is going to come up again in verse 49. Lamech follows the same path as Cain and says that same phrase, wherein he became master Mahan, master of that great secret. So 
As soon as you get in cahoots with Satan, he teaches you a secret, and if you master that secret, you become Master Mahan, which Cain became, and later Lamech. And Hugh Nibley's talked about this. He's coined this the Mahan principle, which simply is this, to convert life into property, whether it's human life or animal life or whatever, to convert it into property. And he talks about how in World War II, he saw this. He said this, what I saw on every side was the Mahan principle in full force, that great secret of converting life into property, your life for my property, and also your life for my promotion. Attached to army groups and various intelligence units during 1945, I took my Jeep all over Western Europe and beheld the whole thing as a vast business operation. I well remember the pain and distress expressed at headquarters as the war wound down and twilight descended on the brilliant military careers, high living, and unlimited financial man manipulations. And how great was the rejoicing when the new concept of brush fire wars was announced to the staff. A simple plan to keep the whole thing going, safely contained, and at a safe distance. O oh, peace, where is thy sting? The Mahan principle was still in full force and remains so to this day. It distressed Hugh Nibley to see at the end of World War II some members of the military rejoicing that they could keep the thing going, that they could keep generating weapons and they could keep the killing going and the promotions running because we've got to keep this whole business of converting life into property. We've got to keep this thing running. And this is a difficult thing because we live in a world where the Lord said to Adam and Eve, you are to subdue the earth, but it's also an invitation for us to be stewards of the earth. And so there's that balance. And we've talked about a lot of this back in section 101 of the Doctrine and Covenants. I think we talked about this back with uh, Doctrine and Covenants 89 as well. But the Mahan principle at its basic level is Cain kills Abel and takes his flocks. But the adversary has also figured out a way to help his servants to get people to be addicted. So they're constantly coming back and having to give their money in exchange for their life. Go back to section 89 and read verse 4. Now, I know that it's a law of health, but if you read the Lord's explanation as to why we have the word of wisdom, it's to prevent conspiring minds from controlling us. It's a modern version of turning life into money. The problem with Cain killing Abel is he can only do it once. Cain can only kill Abel and steal his flocks one time. But the brilliance of modern addiction is that if I can addict you to a substance, I can steal your money throughout your life. Many times I can steal your money. Addiction becomes a classic example of the Mahan principle, where someone has figured out how to turn my life into their money. I would dare say, and we said this many times in the Book of Mormon, that addiction is the secret combinations of our modern day that the Book of Mormon predicts would come. We now see it in addiction. We see addiction not just in substances, but sometimes social media creates addictions that turn our lives into property and money. I have to have that. I have to wear that. I have to do that. Someone will post a video on TikTok or some other social platform, and everyone else has to repeat it and follow them. I have turned my life into their promotion. It's that mayhem principle that causes us to lose agency, and we're forking out our money in order to have what we believe we have to have. They own us because we're addicted. And the more you look at this mayhem principle, you're going to see it everywhere. We saw it in the atrocities of the American slavery, where we turned lives into property and money. Yeah. So the Mahan principle really does invite us into what we call the Darash level of exegesis. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying, okay, we've read the simple meaning, the Peshat, the simple meaning of the text. So what are ways that we can apply this? If you remember, we've talked about this before. Pardes is just the acronym that invites us into the four ways of reading the text. So Peshat is the simple reading. Remez is the hidden meaning or the allegorical meaning we're going to get into in a second. Uh, Darash is the level of applying it to kind of pull out, okay, what are the lessons we learn? And then finally, Sod is this idea of the, the mystical temple 
text? How does it help me approach God both symbolically and literally? I think another lesson we can learn from this, not necessarily tied to the Mahan principle, but from the experience of God talking to Cain. You see, look in verse 22 of Moses 5. Now, this is not in Genesis, but when Cain's freaking out and he's very wroth and his countenance falls in verse 21, right after Cain freaks out, we get to verse 22 and we read, the Lord said to Cain, why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? You see, the Lord isn't condemning him. He's asking him questions to invite him to think. He doesn't come to Cain and say, well, Cain, the reason why you're not happy is because you didn't listen to your father and mother. And how many times do they have to tell you? How many times have we told you to clean your room? Did I ask you that question before? How many times have I told you to clean your room? And why won't you clean it? What's wrong with you? Why are you so lazy? No, he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't lecture him. He just comes to him and says, how are you doing? Why are you upset? I have a friend, her name is Heidi Swap, and she has a podcast called Light the Fight. And I just want to give a shout out to her. And Heidi, I want to just publicly thank you for what you've done to help me to be a better parent. Because there's a little phrase that she taught me. And the phrase is this, don't freak out. You see, this story of the Lord talking to Cain is a great lesson that we can take and apply in our life about parenting. When our kids do stupid stuff, and they're going to do it, If they come to us and they say, Dad, you know, I did this thing, and we freak out on them, what are we teaching them? Are they going to come back to us the next time when something happens? I remember Bryce talked about his son who broke his golf club, and his son tried to fix it with duct tape, and I think that's a great story. Scotch tape. (laughs) Scotch tape. Sorry, I thought it was duct tape. Scotch tape. When he tries to fix it with scotch tape, Bryce, how did you handle that? Well, I decided I could see the club, or I could see the boy. You didn't freak out. I saw a little boy who made a mistake and tried to fix it. Yeah. I think the Lord really has shown us how to handle these types of situations. I mean, he worked to help Cain to see the outcome of his choices, and he worked with Cain in a reasonable and loving way to point out that the choices were Cain's. Those were his choices. So those of us with children, we can learn a lesson. We need to to work to be open and have clear communication with our children in a spirit of love and respect. Because think about this. Do you want to have a relationship with your child? And if you do, what's more important, the act your child made or the relationship? Because our children aren't going to do everything we want them to do. That's just how it is. I mean, welcome to mortality. They have their agency. We don't really have control over them. That really hit me like a ton of bricks as my children became teenagers. It dawned on me, I don't have control. It's an illusion. And so because of that, I've had to really work on this. To me, the foundational text behind all of this is section 121, verses 41 through 46. We're not going to read them because the podcast is already kind of running long, but Go read section 121, 41 through 46, and then look how the Lord handles Cain. And I would submit to you, the Lord is showing us how to have a relationship with our children, how to teach them consequences by asking questions. And let me throw one more in. Go read Alma chapter 39. What does Alma do when Corianton goes astray? I really think that letting the consequences do the teaching is going to do so much more than freaking out and yelling at our kids. And so I love this Darash level of exegesis. Reading this chapter of Moses 5, seeing how the Lord handles it, and then taking that and superimposing it on my relationship with my family, to me, that is the gold, to me. Like, how, how can I apply the scriptures? How do I talk to my kids? How do I talk to those that I love? And how do I preserve the relationship? That's beautiful. I think that's beautiful reading. But with that being said, I'm going to nerd out on what I call the hidden meaning or the remez. To me, on another level, these texts are all related to the temple. And I think the author of Genesis 4 is trying to invite us to think about priesthood. I submit to you on this level that this is a story of a rivalry between two priests. I'm just going to read this from David Butler. He says this, that oftentimes texts like the creation account, as well as many other texts, can be, quote, dressed up and reported as something else when they are in reality temple texts used for ritual purposes. In other words, what if there's a subtext in the book of Genesis of a story of two rival priesthoods? 
and one usurps power and takes over. And we have hints of this in Isaiah. And we have some hints of this in the New Testament. You see, we have a functioning, powerful priesthood in the New Testament. And then we have this other priest who comes and says, I am the true priest. And what do they do? They kill him. And they're so into a vetting. They come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, we're doing all this stuff. And Jesus says, love is more important than all this stuff you're doing. You need to be shamaring. You need to be a keeper, a listener, a watcher, those who are actually have the love of God in them. Now, before I get into that, I got to talk about their names. Adam and Eve have Cain, and then they have Abel. And if you read Genesis 4, verse 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. That verse right there is a pun because Cain, the Hebrew word means acquiring or getting. So Cain means possession. And in Genesis 4.1, Eve states, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So she's punning, she's riffing on that word Cain and his name is the arc of the whole story. Cain wants to gain possession. Now, Abel, the Hebrew word is actually Havel, and it can mean breath or vapor. So I read Havel as Abel is transitory. He's only here for a short time. Well, so am I. I am Abel. I am here as breath or vapor for just a short time. Now, that's one way to read it. Another way to read it is Havel is breath or vapor because Cain kills him. You see, there's so many ways to read it. But this transitory priest is a shamar. If you look in verse 2, it says, She again bare Abel, Havel, and Abel was a shamar. He was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was an aved, a tiller of the ground. Those two words, aved and shamar, are appearing right there in verse 2. And when God comes to Cain and says, Where is your brother? Cain says, I'm not a shamar. I'm not a keeper. And so I think the final level, the sold reading of coming back into God's presence is I got to Aved and Shamar. I've got to be a a tiller, a worker, and a keeper. I think that's the whole package. And so I don't think one's necessarily more important. We should be doing and we should be keeping, but I think doing both brings balance. And so right out of the gate of the first vision, this 14-year-old walks into a grove, and this is difficult But the Lord says, they draw near unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And I would submit to you, it's the same kind of idea. They're using the Bible, they're using the words, but do they believe in revelation? And so Joseph Smith comes out of the sacred grove and he says, it's more than this. And he will be persecuted by that other priest who's trying to put him down. Just like Genesis. Now I'm going to convict myself. Do I put on my white shirt and tie and go to church, but inwardly I'm not a keeper? You see, I need to be a covenant keeper. It's one thing on the outside to be living, but the Lord says, no, it's more. And I think that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. The Sermon on the Mount is the Lord saying, it's important that you do the outside stuff, but the inside stuff is so important. I don't think these words used in the back, what I call the code or the Hebrew backing of these English words, I don't think they're there by chance. I think there's so much there. You know, whether you read Jesus or you read Joseph Smith in the Sacred Grove or the text in the Book of Mormon, all of this stuff is unpacking Genesis. And so that's another reason why I love Genesis and another reason why I love the Book of Mormon. The revelations of the restoration clarify and give beauty to these words. And then you go to the temple and then you're like, oh, there's even more. Yeah. The Lord gave us the Book of Mormon to help us understand the Old Testament. So that leads us to one more example of that, and that is the cursing and the mark put upon Cain, which so much has been done over the history of this world. So much weight has been put on that and misinterpretations, the cursing and the mark that came upon Cain. Now, once again, we turn to the Book of Mormon. Let's understand the cursing and the mark that came upon the Lamanites. And it might be something different than we have held on to for most of our lives. I would ask that you have an open heart and an open mind as we jump into the Book of Mormon. Chapter 2 of First Nephi, the Lord offers everyone a blessing. 
Here's the blessing. Verse 19, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Blessed art thou, Nephi. And I would suggest to every human being, every one of Heavenly Father's children, Blessed art thou, because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently and with lowliness of heart. And anyone who seeks the Lord diligently with a lowliness of heart shall receive a blessing. Here's the blessing. Ready? Verse 20. Inasmuch as you keep my commandments, you shall, number one, prosper, and number two, be led. It may not be monetary prosperity, but he will prosper us, and he will lead us. However, if, in verse 21, you rebel against him, as Cain is going to do, as Laman is going to do, and as some people we love are doing, if we rebel against God, notice the wording here, you shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. You lose the prosperity and the leading. You lose the blessing. Therefore, you're going to be cut off. Number two, the second part of the cursing is in verse 22. Inasmuch as you keep my commandments, thou shalt be made a ruler and a teacher over thy brethren. In other words, part two of the cursing is that you're ruled over. Someone else will rule over you. You will not be free. And then number three, which is verse 23. And I'm going to fill in the antecedent so it makes a little bit more sense. For behold, in that day that they, meaning the Lamanites, shall rebel against me. I will curse them even with a sore curse, and they shall have no power over thy seed, meaning the Nephites, except the Nephites shall rebel against me also. But I want to emphasize no power over. In other words, they'll be weak. And I'm going to use that word specifically because of a promise later on in the Book of Mormon. But let me emphasize, if you obey you are prospered and led. If you don't obey, the result of not being prospered and led will be cut off from the presence, ruled over, and weak. Now compare that to Mosiah chapter 1 verse 13 and listen for the promise and the cursing. Yea, and moreover, I say unto you that if this highly favored people of the Lord should fall into transgression and become a wicked and an adulterous people, that the Lord will deliver them up, that thereby they may become weak like unto their brethren. And he will no more preserve them by his matchless and marvelous power as he has hitherto preserved our fathers. Do you see the blessing and the curse in that single verse? If you're not going to let the Lord lead you, you will become weak and you will be ruled over. That's the curse of Cain. That's the curse of the Lamanites. We'll see this throughout Judges, I think. We'll see this really really clearly. When Israel chooses not to follow God, they are ruled over and they are weak. That's the message of the Old Testament. That's the message of the Book of Mormon. Now, the mark put upon him has always been interpreted as a dark skin. But what if we looked a little bit more broadly and a little bit more figuratively? What if the mark is a dark countenance? What if the result of the cursing is you lose the light of Christ. Wouldn't the absence of the light of Christ bring a darkness upon you? A darkness into your life, a solemn fear? The mark put upon those who end up cursed is darkness, but I would suggest it's more a spiritual darkness than a literal darkness. You are dark inside and that you lose the light of God. And that mark is to warn everyone else around you so that they recognize whether or not I should let you into the inner chambers of my heart. I'm going to love you as my brother. I'm going to try and serve you, but I'm going to be careful letting that into my inner circle. And in the Book of Mormon, it says that they were, the Lamanites were marked to warn the Nephites who they were. 
I think if we carefully read the Book of Mormon, it completely changes our understanding of cursings and marks. And maybe I've allowed a little bit more darkness into my life than I should have. Maybe I need to be more careful to hold on to the promises of the Lord. May this week's study of Cain be a lesson to all of us to not lose the blessing of God prospering us and leading us. So with that, we'll leave you until next week where we cover Enoch. We'll see you next week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.